Well, good morning and welcome to this time of worship here at Rosenberg First United Methodist Church. My name is Jeremy. I'm the pastor here, and I'm grateful for your choice to be with us as we seek to worship our God in spirit and in truth. It is the 4th of July weekend. We celebrate our freedoms and remember the true freedom that we have through the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, we'll boast in the sufficiency of God's grace to give us the freedom to love and serve one another throughout the world around us. Before we get any farther, I want to remind you that there are a couple of things coming up. We've got a small group, a six-week small group from July the 10th through August 14th. It's put on by the gifts team. It'll be a chance to get to know each other a little better, to learn how we are gifted and how we can put those gifts to service in the kingdom of God. I hope that you'll come and join us if you're able to do that. Please let us know RSVP this week if you're interested in coming for those six weeks. If you're interested but can't make it during this time period, we may try to do an online version or uh, another uh, opportunity for it in the future. Uh, So we'd love to hear from you either way. But that's this coming Sunday, July the 10th through August the 14th uh, during the Sunday school hour from 845. To, to 9.45 here at the church. Uh, we've got um, a couple other things on the docket. Uh, tomorrow, of course, is the 4th of July, so our offices will be closed. Uh, if you need to uh, have any church business or let us know anything, uh, you can email us uh, or follow up later on in the week. Uh, we've also got a save the date coming up for our women's retreat. Uh, we'll have a lot more details about that, but they're going to do that in the, uh, a couple of months from now. Uh, so we wanted to get the save the date information out. Check out the weekly bulletin or the, the newsletter uh, for all the specific details of that. But I hope you'll uh, re- let us know if you're interested or if you have any friends or uh, people from churches around. We're trying to advertise this to our whole community. Uh, so that'll be our, our women's retreat coming up uh, in, in the uh, just a couple of months fr- from now. So check out that save the date information. Uh, let us know if you're interested. And uh, the final thing I'll mention is that I, I reference communion uh, in the sermon time today. Uh, we are doing communion in person, of course, because it's the first Sunday, but we do have a group of folks who goes out uh, the week after that to take communion to those who are homebound or otherwise unable to be here in person. So if you'd like to be considered for that list or added to that list, uh, let us know in the church office and and we'll be sure to send somebody out uh, so you can receive those elements of communion uh, in your home, and uh, whether that's just this one time or in the future. We'd love to hear from you uh, if you want to be included with that group. Now, friends, it's with joy and with excitement that we worship our God together. We give thanks that in our weakness, God's strength is made perfect. We give thanks that we don't have to fix the world or know everything or get it all right, but that God's grace is sufficient for everything God is working to do. So friends, in that hope and in that spirit, let us worship our God today together.
We come to the time in our service when we're invited to share with God all that is on our hearts and minds in prayer. This is the 4th of July weekend. I believe tomorrow is actually the 4th. Uh, so, of course, we celebrate the, the freedoms that we have and the freedoms we share. Above all else, I celebrate the freedom that God gives us to live on the foundation of God's sufficient grace for us all. It's the freedom we have to trust that we don't have to get all the answers right. We don't have to get everything perfect. But we can reach out in concern and service for one another. We can lift up our prayer, the prayers of our hearts. We can respond to God's call in our lives, trusting that God's grace is the sufficient power to change everything. And that is the true freedom, to live and to follow God faithfully in this world, knowing that God's grace is sufficient for us all. So friends, in that hope and spirit, let us turn to our God for this moment of prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, we give you thanks that we can worship you. We give you thanks that you invite us to lay all that we have and all that we are at the foot of the cross. We give you thanks that you don't ask us to be perfect. Instead, you ask us to seek you. You don't ask us to get all the answers right. You ask us to trust in your sufficient grace. So God, in our times of trial and struggle, help us to cast our cares upon you. To trust that you will be by our side no matter what difficulties we face. And in all things, to experience that sure foundation of your love and acceptance. God, in times of joy and celebration, remind us of all those good and perfect gifts that you have poured out. Strengthen us to overflow from that abundance so that your goodness would never end with us, but instead would plant the seeds in us that go on to change everything. Today, especially, we give thanks for Jesus, that you humbled yourself to live by our side and sent your Son through the ultimate act of weakness to be the power that transforms everything, to be the power that turns our world upside down so that we can rest upon your sufficient grace in all that we say and think and do. So God, receive the prayers of our hearts this day, all those spoken and unspoken and those that only you know. God, wrap us all in your arms of grace and through everything draw us closer to you. It's in your Son's name that we pray as we join in the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our primary scripture reading for the day comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2-10. through 10. Hear now the word of the Lord. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weakness. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that, I would, that it would leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, hide me behind your cross so that it might be your word that is spoken this day, so that it might be your Holy Spirit that touches our lives and makes us new. Amen. Whenever I am weak, then I am strong. If there is a more counterintuitive message within the Christian faith, I don't think I've ever heard it. Whenever I am weak, then I am strong. I remember knowing at a very young age just how counterintuitive this kind of statement is. 
when I wanted to win those summertime games of backyard football as a kid, when I wanted to win, I wanted the strongest, biggest, fastest kid on my own team. Together, we were strong because we were the strongest, and we won a whole lot of games that way. Anytime a pro team starts a game, and anytime an army goes to war, when I have to move furniture at the house, anytime I know who I want to be on my side, on my team. Intuition tells me every time that strength is of the highest importance, that, that that strength should be my top priority if I get the chance to pick those kinds of sides. I don't know anyone who thinks it makes sense to seek out weakness in order to find strength in any of these areas. Whenever I am weak, then I am strong. You know, if there's a more countercultural message within the Christian faith, I haven't read it yet. Whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Pretty much any time I turn on the TV these days, I'm reminded of how countercultural a statement this is. Whatever controversial topic comes up, I hear that consistent refrain. That refrain that my side is better, that we've got the strongest arguments, that we've got the most people backing us up, that we're too strong to lose this election, this game, this vote, this contest, or whatever else is at stake. And the strongest, most vocal, the best organized side does almost inevitably carry the argument of the day so often. I used to also call it, uh, follow college football a little more closely than I probably should have. And I remember hearing in the offseason just how crazy fast or strong or dominant the incoming recruits were going to be for my team. That same sort of dynamic happens in sports at all levels. Fans either talk about how strong their team is going to be next year, or they simply hang their heads in shame rather than having to admit the weakness they anticipate. The assumption that our ultimate goal is to be the best and the strongest is pervasive in our culture in so many different ways. But whenever I am weak, then I am strong. If there is a more difficult aspect of the Christian faith for me to get my head around, I'm not sure that I've found it yet. Whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Even back as a teenager, I had a hard time accepting that I wasn't the best at everything. I still have a ping pong paddle at the house that bore the brunt of what it felt like to bear the brunt of my competitive edge. About an inch of the wood is gone around the hedges from where I was struggling to accept when I wasn't the best. If you saw me on a tennis court in high school, you would undoubtedly see my racket on the ground almost as much as the tennis ball was. Whenever I married my wife Sally, our minister told us in his homily that we weren't allowed to compete on separate teams for the sake of our marriage. Nothing good would come from us competing against one another. Now, I like to think I'm a little better at handling losing at this point in my life, but there's definitely still a part of me that struggles with accepting that I'm not the strongest, fastest, smartest, best person at anything. Whenever I am weak, then I am strong. This may be a challenging message in our faith on several different levels, but it's also one of the most important for us to remember if we're going to be faithful Christians in this world. These are the words that conclude today's reading from 2 Corinthians. In this portion of Paul's letter to that church in Corinth, we find Paul being a little bit introspective. He begins by referencing another Christian person who was caught up in the third heaven. And of course, there's plenty of speculation about what exactly the third heaven refers to. Unfortunately, like so many other less common references in the Bible, We'll never know exactly what happened or exactly what this tradition was all about. But we can say for sure that Paul is speaking about someone who received an extremely powerful and a very mystical type experience from God. This person clearly saw the kingdom of God as what God is building in this world. This person heard things so holy and so profound that no mortal is permitted to repeat them. This person had a truly wonderful, almost unimaginable experience of God. And Paul starts by recalling this experience to make it clear that on behalf of someone like that, someone who has that kind of experience, on behalf of them, he will boast. On behalf of the most godly, the most transformed, the most holy people, he will boast. But he will not boast on his own behalf, except on account of his weakness. 
Now, I'm impressed already if Paul was really able to keep this up. It's not easy to boast of our own weakness. Weaknesses are those things we tend to hide from the world, those things that we like to pretend aren't really there, those things that we wish we could just go, make go away with all our might. We want to just get rid of the weaknesses. Weakness is not something we like to highlight for the world around us to hear about. And you can actually see how hard it is to not boast in ourselves, not to not boast about the good things whenever Paul continues on. Because right immediately after this, he says, I could boast in myself and it would be true. In other words, God gave me some pretty incredible revelations too. God did some pretty great things in my life. I could boast, but I won't. I won't actually do it. He boasts about himself that he could boast if he wanted to, but says, no, I'll just boast in my weakness instead. And just to keep me in check, Paul continues, God gave me a thorn in the flesh. Three times Paul prayed for that thorn to be removed, and the Lord said no. And there's plenty of speculation about what that exact thorn was. Some suggest it was some kind of speech impediment. Others think it was some type of physical disability. Still others think it was a deformation of some kind. Again, we simply won't ever know exactly for sure what the thorn was. When this section of, Christian, uh, of Corinthians comes up, I've often heard the focus placed on the thorn itself, trying to focus on what that thorn was. God gave the thorn to Paul, the logic goes. It was something that hindered his ability to do ministry in some way, but he still managed to do an incredible amount. He still managed, managed to do more to start the spread of the Christian church than just about any other person alive. It's a pretty powerful message for those of us who have ever seen or known this type of thorn in our own life. It's powerful for us who have seen some sort of limit on what we think we're capable of in ministry and mission in the world. If Paul could do great things with a thorn in his side, so that message usually goes. If he could still do great things, just imagine what God can do with the thorn in your own side. And that's a message that is true enough. That's a message that makes for a great rally cry and a pep talk speech about what we can still accomplish if we'll push forward even in spite of the thorns in our side. But the presence of the thorn is far less significant than the grace of God. The message is not about the thorn at all. It's about the grace of God. God doesn't simply say no to taking the thorn away. What God actually says to Paul is that my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. For power is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient. In other words, it's not just that God can still do great things, even if we're imperfect. It's much stronger than that. More often than not, we need to figure out how to get our strength and our ideas and our ambitions out of the way to get ourselves out of the way so that God is able to do even greater things than we could ever think to do on our own. That's why Paul continues, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I'll be content in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. And finally, we arrive back where we started today. Wherever, whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Whenever I am weak, then I am strong. I really wonder how many of the church's greatest problems could be resolved if we learned how to boast not in our strength, but in the sufficiency of the grace of God. I wonder how much less divided the church would have become, how much less divisive theology would be. I wonder how much more accepting and loving and caring and kind we would look to the world if we learned to boast not in our own actions, if we learned to take the focus off of our strength and our understanding, if instead we boasted only in the sufficiency of the grace of God, we boasted exclusively in the grace of God and what God is able to do. I wonder how different our lives would be if we took Paul's message more seriously. Whenever I am weak, then I am strong, because it's not about me. It's about the sufficient grace of God. And I have to imagine a big part of the challenge is just how counterintuitive, countercultural, and just how outright difficult this message is to live out. 
the Christian church as a whole is in a precarious position. We've been in this place for a while. Numbers are falling in every major denomination. Influence is waning on the popular imagination. So much of the way things used to work out, so much of the way they used to be, just doesn't make sense anymore. Christians everywhere struggle to know just what faithful living might look like in this new and different kind of world. To think way back, um, to think the way back to strength is by embracing weakness. To think getting back on top of the world to be more influential. To think that our goal of winning the battle is accomplished through weakness. That sounds foolish at best. It's just obviously foolishness to think the way back to strength is through weakness. I mean, weakness is what happens when you aren't trying hard enough. Weakness is what causes me to fail time and time again. Weakness causes me to give in to the next temptation. Weakness makes me settle for less than my goals in life. Weakness leads good people to turn their heads when terrible things happen rather than step in and make things better. Weakness in our world is to be avoided at all costs. Weakness has no redeeming value. At least these are the kinds of messages that we tell ourselves. These are the kinds of messages that we tell ourselves when we refuse to let ourselves be weak. And it makes perfect sense why we might be tempted to think of weakness in only these terms. The cost of being weak in plenty of situations is too great to, be, to accept. We know the costs of being weak in the world around us. But there is a dramatic difference in what it means to be weak in the Lord. You see, weakness in the Lord is not about how hard we work or how often we fail. It's not about avoiding confrontation. Weakness is all about boasting in the sufficiency of the grace of God. Way too often we boast in our own knowledge and our understanding. We boast in our ability to live a holy life. We boast in what we are able to accomplish on our own. Pretty much every time I see a controversial issue arise in relation to a church's long-held beliefs, every time that happens, I hear more and more doom and gloom predictions about what will happen if the church doesn't put a line in the sand and figure out a way to change the culture around us. And the more doom and gloom predictions I hear, the more I doubt that we know how to boast in the sufficiency of God's grace. The more we think that anything, any power, any trend, any fact in our world can overcome the grace of God, the more we act like that, the more I doubt we understand how to embrace the weakness of our God, how to embrace that weakness that is actually the strength to change the whole world. Plenty of issues will touch the lives of huge numbers of people. And it's not that the outcomes of those things are ever unimportant. I just wonder sometimes if we recognize that no matter what wrong decision we might make, no matter how far off course the world might get, God is still more than capable of transforming us. God is still more than capable of bringing us into right relationship with God and with one another. God's grace is still sufficient for us all. Whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Weakness in the Lord means accepting that we don't have all the answers. Weakness is not about refusing to fight for fear of losing. Weakness in the Lord entails asking forgiveness for all the things that we've gotten wrong. Weakness is not about pretending like everything is perfect just because God is a part of our lives and decisions. Weakness in the Lord requires that we know there is nothing we can do. There's no mountain we can climb, no problem we can solve, no stance we can take. There's no change we could make that will ever earn the love and the grace of our God. Because we never deserve God's grace. To deserve grace would be to put a premium on our strength to attain it. But in our weakness, we find that grace is a free gift of our God. We find that God's grace is sufficient. Whenever I am weak, then I am strong. You won't find a better reminder of this message than in the sacrament of communion. In the sacrament of communion, we celebrate the fact that God not only came into our world in the person of Jesus Christ, but God also submitted his life to the point of death on a cross. God submitted to death on a cross so that nothing would ever be the same. It was in this ultimate act of humility and humiliation. 
It was in this ultimate act of weakness that Christ gave up his life for our sake. And through that act of weakness, the strength of God was made perfect. Through that act of weakness, the world will never be the same. And communion is the most tangible, the most physical reminder that our faith at its very core is counterintuitive, it's countercultural, and it's downright difficult to get our heads around. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. God's grace is sufficient. God will redeem the whole world. This fact doesn't immediately solve all our problems, but it does remind us that any solution requires that we start not with our own effort. It requires we start not with our own ability. Any solution requires that we start with the sufficient grace of our God. Boast not in your own strength, but in the grace of the one who became weak so that we would know true strength in him. Freedom at its core rests in knowing that the fate of the world is not in your hands and it's not in mine. All of creation is in the hands of the one who loves us, the one who redeems us, the one who will be here and whose grace is sufficient no matter how flawed, imperfect, or weak we become. Because whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Through our weakness, we're invited to boast in the Lord, knowing that it is God's grace Not our strength, not our knowledge, not what we do or don't do or what we know or where we go from here. It's nothing about us at all that matters in the end. The foundation on which we stand, the very foundation of our lives and our faith is that God's grace is sufficient for you and me. God's grace is sufficient for all. And through the grace of God, it is God's power we will know. Because whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Whenever I am weak, I'm invited to experience the sufficient grace of our God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Well, friends, this concludes another time of worship today. Don't forget there is um, a six-week small group starting next Sunday. That's 845 during the Sunday school hour up at the church. Let us know in the church office if you're interested in attending. Uh, There is a a book you'll be invited to to read through as we go through that six-week study, learning more about our gifts and how we can put those gifts to service in God's kingdom. There's also uh, one other link I didn't mention earlier, a link in the notes to the service. It's from our leadership board. We've got kind of a 30-month framework for how we're looking to to move forward. Uh, I've been talking for the last several months and over a couple of years, really, uh, about some of the the big picture and kind of future of our church. Uh, So that framework is linked there in the uh, um, June board update. Uh, If you want to know kind of what our leadership is looking at, kind of how we're approaching some of these uh, challenges and figuring out how we develop a plan so that God will continue to work through our congregation both now and long into the future. If you've got any questions or feedback along the way, whether immediately or in the future, I'd love to hear from you. We can sit down for a cup of coffee or you can just shoot me a quick email if you have any thoughts about uh, the conversations that we're having or kind of where we go from here. Uh, but I'm excited for all that God is going to continue to do. We've got some good uh, relationships, good partnerships going with Twin City Community Church uh, and with Two Lives Change. We've got another uh, Baptist church planning organization we're working with a little bit to try to be a little creative about how we connect with our community and how we can kind of share and what God is doing in this neighborhood. Uh, plenty of other ideas or some thoughts about things going on into the future. Uh, but if you've got an uh, event in mind or a small group or anything that you want to uh, consider putting on or something that w- you think would really help us connect with each other, connect with our neighbors, and ultimately connect with our God, uh, I'd love to hear from you what your ideas are or how we can be more faithful to serve one another and to continue to grow together as God's people in this world. Now, friends, go forth from this place. Go knowing that God's grace is sufficient for us all. And when we are weak, then Christ is strong. Go in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.